Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, or if you happen to be catching this video later, then of course, good afternoon, good evening, good day. I'm always tweaking the ideal uh, social media video greeting. So I do hope you will be so kind to forgive me as I work on that process. Today, there are some things I wanna talk about. Uh, on my agenda, I want to talk about the ongoing debate between capitalism and socialism. Even more specifically, I want to talk about democratic socialism versus social democracy. Also, I want to talk a little bit more about uh, former Vice President Joe Biden. There was an interesting article about him in the New York Times that uh, I read this morning that has got me thinking. And finally, I want to take a look at a few of the other 2020 candidates. I want to share with you what stands out to me about some of them uh, thus far in this process of debate and examination and contemplation and deliberation as to what our policy priorities need to be moving forward and uh, how our leadership should be advancing as well in the United States. Uh, however, I want to begin today uh, with a moment of uh, comment on the awful events to transpire yesterday in Southern California, in Poway, California at the Shabbat of Poway Synagogue. There was a, obviously, if you may have heard, uh, it's been on the news all over. There was, of course, an unfortunate, um, there was a shooting, uh, yet another one, and uh, there was a life lost. That was uh, Lori Kay. Lori Kay is her name. She was 60 years old, and she passed away having shielded her rabbi uh, during the shooting. And I do think it's important that we take a moment to think about this, uh, to reflect on this, to grieve, and to recognize this. One thing I wish I'd done more of in the past is really pause more and meditate more on the violence, uh, these uh, shootings that are plaguing this country, uh, that we are yet to deal with politically, um, legislatively. And um, I think we need to acknowledge also a clear theme in uh, violence that we are seeing uh, that is increasing, and that is this uh, white supremacy nonsense and this anti-Semitism nonsense. And I think we can acknowledge the fact that uh, President Trump has not done his share to uh, offer conciliatory um, rhetoric to put proper attention to just how troubling this situation is. And so I do really want to say uh, that there is very blatant white supremacy uh, in this country today, and we're just not um, addressing this properly. And we obviously see this across the world in white nations. Um, you may know the suspect, John Ernest, a mere 19 years old, by the way. He did cite uh, the Tree of Life synagogue shooting six months ago, and the mosque shootings in New Zealand and the white supremacy and anti-Semitism with respect to that, he cited these as inspirations. I think we really need to pause for several reasons here. First of all, 19 years old. First of all, how does a 19 year old, 19 year old person today get their hands on a gun? That's, I mean, you can't consume, you can't legally consume alcohol in the United States, and yet 
outside of serving in the military, were willing to put a gun in your hands. This to me is extraordinarily troubling. Now, I don't know just yet if the proper policy moving forward is going to be that we actually increase the age in which people can buy guns from 1821. However, I have to say, as long as we're going to have a conversation about saying people shouldn't be smoking until they're 19 in some states, like here in New Jersey, people shouldn't be drinking until they're 21, but then clearly they should not have guns in their hands at 19 and certainly not so easily. So we really must have a conversation about how to prevent guns from falling in the hands of the wrong people. Now, I understand critics are going to say that it's going to happen anyway, but practice uh, across the world seems to contradict that information. Certainly, uh, there's a conversation to be had about that and a deeper examination of the evidence. I'm definitely happy to take a look at that with you in the future. But I just did want to acknowledge the fact that um, aside from all of the other is issues going on today, there are just too many shootings and there is too much white supremacy. And um, also, I think that we need to have a conversation about the mental health element of this too. You have to ask yourself, what in the world compels a 19-year-old to become so filled with hate that this individual feels motivated to go and, and shoot innocent human beings simply because of a religion they identify with or because of the color of their skin? I mean, this is just unacceptable. I mean, you obviously as I understand it, can't be in any kind of healthy, even remotely rational state of mind to perpetrate this kind of violence. And the fact is, we're seeing this, this form of mental illness persist in this country. And I believe that you have even further evidence that it doesn't always manifest itself, say, in shootings, but it manifests itself with the abuse of opioids, right? It manifests itself in heroin. It manifests, manifests itself in alcoholism. It manifests itself in marijuana addiction. It manifests itself in serious, crazy anxiety. It manifests itself in poverty. We have serious mental illness issues, I believe, that are troubling this country. And I believe that we must have a deeper, more probing, more assertive conversation on this. And I also believe uh, attached to this situation, we want to have a conversation about a public health care option for anyone who cannot presently afford health care. It is utterly unreasonable to allow our nation, population, people in our population, in our communities, to persist with mental illness to the point that they are moved to shoot others and kill others. They are moved to abuse drugs and they're just sinking in poverty. And I mean, these are just some of the, you know, top uh, symptoms and consequences. And so it, it seems to me that this is something um, that we just can't sit back on. I believe we really have to be more aggressive. I believe we have to be more assertive here. I just really do. So I want to say uh, to that end, then, I'm so sorry to the loved ones of um, to everyone who was affected by this awful, awful shooting in Poway at the uh, Shabbat of Poway synagogue. And I want to say that uh, I'm horrified at the violence, this kind of violence that persists in our nation. And certainly, I pledge to do my part in speaking out against this and um, reaching out to those of you who want to um, collaborate uh, 
um, one way, shape, or form or another in seeing an end to this through policy reforms and through um, reflection and such. So I just wanted to spend a little bit of time on that. Moving on, I also want to talk about the classic economic debate of capitalism versus socialism. I think it's almost a sort of, um, there's a silver lining to the emergence of Vermont Senator Bernie Sanders um, once again finding himself somewhat successful in his uh, bid for the presidency in that um, as a result of his radical economic thinking uh, as a socialist, certainly he is, and with association of those like Ocasio-Cortez, a uh, representative of New York, um, bringing up an important conversation uh, whereby Democrats have to uh, take the responsibility to be a lot clearer and more succinct in explaining and identifying exactly what it is they actually believe philosophically and how that translates into policies. And so we do have um, Bernie, Bernie Sanders um, articulating this intense uh, socialist rhetoric. And you can see from previous blogs that I have uh, put out there that um, there are a variety of definitions that come along with socialism uh, and we need to think about what it means for somebody to declare oneself as a socialist and how that contrasts with declaring oneself as a capitalist. And it's interesting because a lot goes on here because you can call yourself a socialist uh, and yet actually subscribe to a lot of uh, capitalistic ideas like the right to private property and uh, businesses and things, you know, the, the belief that private businesses can exist, and yet people will still call themselves a socialist, not really understanding what goes along with the word socialist. Um, on the other hand, you have the libertarian camp, who considers themselves the only true capitalists, uh, and believe that the concept of capitalism and uh, a regulated capitalism somehow there can't be a uh, coexistence there. So in that vein, I'd start you with an interesting article that was published this morning by the Washington Post. It was written by Stephanie Murphy, who is a Democrat. She represents Florida's seventh congressional district in the US House of Representatives. Interesting tidbit about uh, Congresswoman Stephanie Murphy. She is the first Vietnamese woman to serve in the US House of Representatives. So that's interesting. And uh, so she has an interesting article. It's called, I'm a proud Democrat. I'm also a proud capitalist. And uh, so I want to just, there are two there are a few lines, there's more than two, but there are a few lines I underlined here. A few things she said I underlined, which struck me as meaningful and helpful as we have this conversation about the debate on capitalism versus socialism. So here's what she says. With respect to the term socialism, she says, this term carries historical baggage that can evoke painful feelings in Americans whose families experienced communism or socialism in its darkest form. I think that's actually well worth repeating. So I'm going to one more time because I really want that to um, resonate. I really want that to get the time it deserves to, to sink in. It's an important thing here. Here's what Congresswoman Murphy says. 
Socialism carries historical baggage that can evoke painful feelings and Americans whose families experienced communism or socialism in its darkest form. Right, so where have we seen some of the worst uh, examples of practice of communism? Obviously, China and Soviet Union are two, I think, of the most prominent examples. And I think the point here is that it's true that you could be someone like Bernie Sanders or Ocasio-Cortez and refer to yourself as a socialist uh, without uh, meaning to say that you believe in the confiscation and abolition of all private property and state management of all resources and a kind of um, totalitarian management of a country and such. However, I think we have to really pay attention to what it means to call yourself a socialist. And as Congresswoman Murphy says, it's somewhat irresponsible to parade your, in my, in my opinion, it's intellectual, intellectually irresponsible to parade oneself about saying I'm a socialist, I'm a socialist, socialism, 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 without appreciating the fact that indeed so many things under socialist um, principles, so-called socialist principles, have done serious damage um, just in the last century or so. Now, the, you put it on the flip side, what does it mean to be a capitalist? And obviously, there is a sense of purebred capitalism, just as there is a sense of purebred socialism. Right. On the other hand, the one of the darkest, and most awful consequences of capitalism, things done in the name of capitalism um, that remind us why we have to have such a, I believe, a more nuanced discussion about these terms. Um, if you were to call yourself a capitalist, what is it that you mean? What was done in the name of capitalism, as I was saying? Well, people came in to North America and committed grand theft and genocide against the Native Americans, the American Indians, as uh, some also say, or prefer, the term that some prefer to use. Um, and you had the situation, of course, the tragedy, uh, of slavery that was committed. These things done in the name of so-called capitalism, ownership, private ownership. And so I think what we do see is the fact that both notions of pure capitalism and notions of pure socialism and just labeling yourself a socialist or just labeling yourself a capitalist, it's probably not a good idea um, because the clear implication would be that you're either for some kind of um, pure laissez-faire freedom in which you can hurt others, exploit others, enslave others, expropriate from others, um, et cetera. Or, you know, on the, on the socialist end, you really can do the same thing, except instead of calling yourself uh, someone in private enterprise, you do it under the guise of a state. So I think when we have conversations about this, we need to be careful. So. That's where uh, I think of this other article. And this is almost a year old now, this article. Um, but I, it's, it was published by the Washington Post back in, goodness, I have a date on this. Um, I guess I don't. I thought I did. Um, but it was published, I believe, last August, I want to say. And it was written by a, a political science professor who taught at, uh, who teaches at Bernard College. And um, her name is Sherry Bernman. And the name of this article, you may want to look it up, and uh, I will um, link it to you also. Uh, Democratic socialists are conquering the left, but do they believe in democracy? It's a good question. 
And the bottom line of this article is that as we examine conversations about capitalism, socialism, and also democracy, we do see the emergence of two particular camps of thought here. We see an emergence of people who identify as democratic socialists, and we see the emergence of a group of people who think of themselves as social democrats. What is the difference between the two? The democratic socialists, their ultimate end is to employ democracy as a means to get to a, a system of socialism, actual socialism, whereby people, um, whereby the state manages the resources as opposed to you privately having the right to possess them yourself versus the social democrats who believe that who acknowledge that uh, there are benefits to a free enterprise system a capitalistic system but left unguarded left unregulated left without rules to make the competition more fair it's easy for people to be exploited thus this uh, capitalistic framework needs to have the proper rules so that everybody can have and enjoy the fruits of opportunity and you know basic um, dignity basic access to resources and i will tell you that i absolutely subscribe to the um, social democrat uh, viewpoint and you can go to publiccomment.blog and peruse and find that in fact i've got a um, more granular explanation of how i arrive at that um, but the bottom line to me seems that it really makes no sense to let anyone have complete charge of an economy whether you put complete charge in a private sector that has no accountability or you put complete authority in the state with no accountability. I like when the private sector and the public se sector can compete against each other. And I like when they can hold each other accountable. And I like the notion that people can, um, in fact, through playing fairly, acquire their own wealth. There's a great article, in fact, on the Washington Post published last night. And let me get that one up for you. Um, I should have had that with me. I don't, or I didn't, and I apologize. But it was a such a noteworthy article that I want to I want to bring this up. Yeah, it was written by David Von Drell. It's on the opinions page in the Washington Post, and I can show you what this awesome article looks like. Um, it's called, We Shouldn't Idolize Wealth, We Shouldn't Demonize It Either. Um, I definitely encourage you to take a look at this article because uh, in, in my opinion, it puts it all really quite well. Right? The fact is that people should have the right to private property, people should have the right to thrive and accumulate things and grow wealth and, you know, enjoy life and the fruit of their labors, etc. But if people are cheating, that's unacceptable. If people are thrown into unfair situations via exploitation or systemic neglect, I mean, that's unacceptable. And so that's why I, uh, that's why I consider myself a social democrat. That's why I feel protective of a um, regulated capitalistic system. And that would be one more reason why I find myself concerned with the rhetoric that comes out of uh, the mouth of Senator Bernie Sanders of Vermont. Now I want to uh, move on. By the way, I do encourage you always to leave comments um, and I will ponder them. Uh, you have any particular thoughts or um, nuanced um, 
collaborations that could perhaps elucidate how we further this conversation in the future. I, I do want to hear from you. So there is a good article that came out in the New York Times this morning that I had the opportunity to read a little bit um, longer than I expected, uh, but I didn't mind. Uh, the headline, Biden and Obama's Odd Couple Relationship Aged into Family Ties by Peter Baker. You take a look at what it looks like, and you can see also, I, I do like to do my annotations, of course. Um, but I definitely encourage you to give it a read. Some things that stood out to me here that really made me think, um, one of them. One of the things that really got my attention was uh, a comment referenced in this article by former defense secretary under Presidents Bush and Obama, Robert M. Gates. So I'm just going to read, uh, read this line to you from this article. Uh, talks about how Biden was, um, quote, on the opposite side of many debates with Defense Secretary Robert M. Gates, who in his memoir called the vice president wrong on nearly every major foreign policy and national security issue over the past four decades. That's a huge and um, provocative allegation to make. And that does lead me to want to really probe into and dig into um, former Vice President Joe Biden's foreign policy record and the history of positions that he has advocated. Obviously, uh, uh, you know, on the surface, the first thing that comes to my mind is Biden's unfortunate um, position on Iraq, having been initially um, in favor, voting in favor of the invasion of Iraq, where that proved to be uh, profoundly um, problematic for us and led, in fact, to the um, influx and growth of ISIS in that vacuum which we created after early withdrawal from Iraq. Um, you know, there's another thing here that troubled me about how Biden was characterized that is a sort of red flag for something that's definitely worthy of further investigation as well. Um, in fact, I, I found this strange. Um, so it has to do with, a, it's, a, it's a reference to Biden's um, book, Promise Me Dad, the memoir that he wrote. Um, something I've got to read, definitely uh, will, and will give you my thoughts on it in the near future as soon as I can. Still trying to digest slowly the Mueller report, so you'll forgive me, I hope. Um, but anyway, uh, Mr. Baker, who wrote this article, did cite uh, Biden's book, this little passage, this little fragment from it, and talks about one of Biden's key frustrations at times with former President Barack Obama. So he says, um, Biden grew frustrated by Mr. Obama's ponderous decision-making process. Quote, he, President Obama, was deliberate to a fault. Close quote, Mr. Biden wrote diplomatically, diplomatically in his book, Promise Me Dad. And so what strikes me about this is what could it mean to be deliberate to a fault? What could that mean? Um, I get that you could argue that it would mean someone is indecisive. You know, and I, I grant you that you really can't always take a quote by itself, such a short one in that context is important. But this did strike me that it would seem as if the notion here is that Biden is critical of Obama, essentially, for taking his time and being really contemplative and scrupulous. And it troubles me 
that Biden, on the other hand, wouldn't be quite as contemplative, uh, as if Biden would somehow be more impulsive. Uh, that would trouble me. I would want someone who could be a little bit more uh, level-headed and really hear what advisors have to say and measure very carefully all the different options. Granted, again, I've got to go out and actually read the memoir and scour the uh, deeper context behind the, that small little quote. Again, nonetheless, um, clearly there is a difference in how uh, considerations were digested by Biden in contrast to uh, former President Obama. And if Biden's criticism is that Obama is just, you know, um, so contemplative in his time spent to really measure the options, I'm not aware of a situation in which um, that specific quality did any damage to um, the country. There are things President Obama has done that I don't agree with. I'm not sure any of them would have been a result of him being too contemplative. So I'm not sure what this might suggest about Biden, but, um, and I don't know how different people are going to interpret this article, but um, I'm seeing some potential red flags about Biden. Again, that's without reading his memoir, that's without seeing how he moves forward in policy proposals, and that's without seeing how he conducts himself in contrast to the folks he's running against and in debates and such. Um, and uh, that's not to say that just because he has flaws that I would absolutely discount him, except to say these are some things that I find specifically disconcerting about him that I'm going to want to know more about, especially as I'm measuring him against other candidates for the same position. I guess one notable thing that um, stood out to me as I was reading this article about Biden was that um, in the uh, while the uh, election of 2012 was going on, Biden essentially beat President Obama to the punch and said that he was in favor of gay marriage, of the legalization of uh, same-sex marriage. And he had done this without any um, advance to Obama and Obama's advisors, apparently. And this made them feel caught off guard. And um, of course, I'm not sure that I you know, think that was an awful thing to do. In fact, that is one thing that sort of uh, strikes me as Biden showing himself at least to be a very independent thinker and someone who feels, in a sense, I don't know, not beholden or something. And certainly someone who understood that um, social justice and equality and civil rights and such needed to move uh, faster and harder than Obama was going to do on his own initiative at that time. So um, there is some serious uh, significance, both in the negatives and the positives, as we're taking a deeper look at uh, Vice President Joe Biden. Uh, and another thing, uh, perhaps this goes without saying uh, for some of us, while for others this would be a disqualifier if you're Republican or conservative, leaning um, independent or libertarian or an extremely moderate Democrat, perhaps. But I mean, the fact of the matter is, I think one of the best things that Biden has going for him um, is actually not his electability, and that's conversational move towards more, a little, a little bit more depth in a second. However, um, what I do really like about Biden that I consider perhaps extraordinarily necessary given the context of how President Trump has absolutely destroyed um, the governance and uh, activity of the executive branch in the last two years, uh, is the fact that 
former Vice President Biden has experience in the executive branch, and he has experience in the upper echelons of the executive branch, and he has experience one-on-one -on -one with the president, and he has experience really contemplating all these serious issues, and he has the benefit of having to be able to reflect after eight years of uh, experience in the executive branch, plus his decades of experience in um, Congress. So, you know, on the surface, he definitely has, I believe, um, a uh, sense of experience that certainly, again, on the surface, but significantly so, gives him a, uh, a point worth um, serious advantage as we uh, measure him and contrast him to other candidates. Um, but we're talking about the issue of electability. And that brings me to another interesting article I read uh, that is an editorial by the Washington Post published, published yesterday. And the article is called, Who Would Make the Ideal President? Here's where we start. Take a peek. It's not a terribly long editorial. It's totally worth reading. Um, so you may want to take a look at it. And uh, the first thing to stand out to me as I was reading this editorial, something I highlighted that I like very much. Uh, this is from the Washington Post. Quote, we think the best way to judge electability is not through polling data or race, gender, or geography. Instead, let's try to judge who would make the best president, close quote. I mean, it seems so simple. And yet, how often already, as we're talking about this primary contest, do we have people saying things like, oh, Biden's the only one who can win against Donald Trump. Uh, this guy is electable. This guy is not electable. Bernie Sanders is absolutely not electable because of things he wrote in his college newspaper a half a century ago, you know, blah, blah, blah. Uh, nothing to do whatsoever with, again, as the Washington Post puts it, um, who would make the best president as we consider their actual leadership styles, as we consider their policy agendas and such. So, um, I just really love that point, and I really love this editorial. Um, but the Washington Post did also, in this editorial, bring up some things that um, they believe that we ought to consider as priorities as we're contemplating who the best presidential candidate might be. And on the top of that list for them, and I like this a lot, is this. Uh, the Washington Post writes as follows. For us, the first requirement in this cycle is a fundamental commitment to the norms, habits, and values of democracy. The best and therefore most electable challenger will be committed to civil debate and respect for opponents. She or he will embrace the nation's diversity as an asset rather than looking to divide with scapegoats and imagined enemies. Compromise will be accepted as a handmaiden of principle, not its opposite. Public service and public servants will be respected. Congress and the judiciary will be acknowledged as equal branches. Law enforcement, intelligence agencies, and the military will be understood to be beyond politics. Close quote. I mean, in the context of the times, that's damn near poetry to me, or poetic prose or something like that. Timeless. Um, I think I would cite that 50 years from now as an important commentary on what was politically crucial to contemplate today. So this is a valuable editorial to read, posted yesterday by the Washington Post. Who would make the ideal president? Here's where we start. Again, it's the name of the article. And I think what I'll do is um, 
provide a link on my Facebook to some of these articles that I'm citing, a sort of working um, works cited page bibliography, if you will. Um, but I think this notion of being civil and uh, having civil debate is an absolutely crucial quality in a leader. And specifically as we watch President Trump, I mean, he is the complete opposite, right? And he's destroyed uh, any sense of civility in the executive branch, you know? I'm not saying, yeah, obviously there are people I know who are in our executive branch, unrecognized, unnamed, hardworking individuals who don't get the credit they deserve, who are shadowed by um, deep seeds of corruption and unethical um, execution of the laws uh, that uh, get overlooked here. But um, I think the point is that um, we've seen a presidential administration that has really flipped our sense of, I think, um, what our democracy means to us upside down. It really has, um, I think it's caused a lot of the country to pause. Uh, the correspondence dinner last night, um, I don't know if you happened to catch it, um, but uh, I forget the name of the historian who was speaking. He made an interesting comment that we live in an era where the politicians are considered a joke while the comedians are taken really quite seriously. I think that does put it really quite well, doesn't it? And so we do need a candidate, I believe, who first and foremost does understand that because it has to do, therefore, with leadership and leadership style and what it, what it means to actually lead. What's being done to build morale and confidence and trust and good feeling and confidence and uh, sense of encouragement and true achievable vision in the interest of Americans. That's what we absolutely need. And that's why as we really look at, I think the um, other contenders in this 2020 primary, we have to ask who's more focused on that as opposed to, I don't know, trying to sell a book or just make a name for themselves or just frankly, um, isn't as sure of what they were doing as perhaps they you know, thought on the surface. And that brings me to what is next. And that is a conversation about our list of candidates. I just had my list. And where did it go? I hate when this happens. You, I hope you will forgive me for this uh, technical difficulty here. But um, what I did was I did take a look at the most complete list uh, of current Democratic uh, primary contenders. I put a red star next to the names uh, of the, of the um, candidates that have my attention most at this point in time. Now, I think it's important to say here that none of us, in my opinion, should be hasty. I don't believe we're at a point where any of us can say, well, this person can't win, or this person can't win, or that person's the only one with a chance, or that person's definitely the one with the biggest chance. I think all of that would be hasty. And by the way, we couldn't prove it. Um, but I believe it's important for us to have learned uh, from the election in 2016 that um, it's not always going to happen as you expect. You know, I have a principle I call the Titanic principle. And it essentially means this, don't be cocky. And one of those elements of not being cocky means don't walk around thinking you know everything, right? Don't walk around saying your ship is unsinkable because then it's going to crash into an iceberg and a large swath of people are going to die. So, um, yeah, I call myself a proponent of the Titanic principle. It's something I follow. Don't be cocky. Don't be hasty. Um, Okay, so 
here are the candidates that have my attention the most. And I'll tell you why. So we talked about Joe Biden. Um, I haven't discounted Biden yet, though again, uh, it has been brought up the concerns I have about him at this point. Um, I also have an interest in uh, Julian Castro. I have an interest in Kristen Gillibrand. I have an interest in A.B. Klobuchar. I have an interest in Beto O'Rourke. And I have an interest in Elizabeth Warren. Uh, so I'm going to go uh, down this list and talk to you about what impresses me about these candidates and some reservations I might have as well. Uh, I think we could exclude Biden, though, because we've um, done a sufficient, I think, uh, bit of conversation about him. Um, I want to talk now about Julian Castro. Uh, to begin with, Julian Castro, you know, he's a former U.S. Secretary of Housing and Urban Development. Um, he was mayor of San Antonio. And um, what impresses me most about him, well, like Biden, I mean, he has experience in the executive branch. So he has a meaningful federal government experience, um, specifically at a time when the administration of federal government has been so um, perverted by the current president. I do believe that um, veterans of a time when it was not yet so ruined, the ethos there, um, it would probably benefit us. So he has that to offer, uh, just looking at his resume alone. Uh, I should say also, I like that um, Mr. Castro is um, taking very seriously the need to have immigration reform. Obviously, as we've seen the president and a uh, large swath of nationalists exploit our immigration troubles and use it as a means to um, really do cruel and awful things such as ripping infants from their parents, uh, such as absolutely not follow the law and give people due process at the border who are seeking political asylum. Um, Castro could look at this the other way. Castro is very passionate about um, looking at people who are crossing the border, not as these awful <laughs> federal criminals, uh, but he gave a good conversation about this on NPR in an interview last Friday, um, how we would treat it more like um, a violation, you know, that, you know, something was done wrong. <laughs> that is, you know, you can't really cross the border illegally, but are you to be treated like, you know, someone who committed grand theft? Or, you know, is this something more in the realm of like fining someone or something like that? Um, I do believe, therefore, that uh, Mr. Castro has a sense of leadership in understanding that immigration is a issue of vulnerability. And by the way, Castro is not out there saying, like certain other lawmakers are, that we need to destroy ICE and get rid of that and do away with law enforcement. But he is coming out uh, with actual policy proposals and addressing the fact that we have an immigration system that's definitely not working, again, that's being exploited by the right and the nationalists and the president. So uh, he has my attention uh, with respect to that. Um, where I would say I'm remaining not in love with Castro at this point is, I mean, I'd like to hear him talk about some other things a little bit more um, vividly. Uh, and concerned about, I want more conversation from him on healthcare. I want more conversation with him on the electoral college. I want more conversation with him about accountability from the president. Um, I think these are um, sort of super priority issues. Next, um, Kirsten Gillibrand. You know, I have to say, she's probably at this point in time up there as one of my top favorite contenders. 
uh, I'd say at this point, tied pretty much with Elizabeth Warren. Um, what do I like about Gillibrand? Um, here's what is most impressive about Gil Gillibrand. Uh, I apologize, I said Gillibrand instead of Gillibrand. It's a, a gaffe and an error, I apologize for it. But what really impresses me about Gillibrand is this. Here is a woman who has the courage to say, hey, some years ago, I was utterly wrong. I made mistakes and I corrected those mistakes and I'm open to learning and improving myself. And this I believe is paramount in leadership because when you have someone who walks around thinking they know everything, oh wait, I think I was just describing the president of the United States presently, I think that's President Trump. Look at the problems that arise, the lack of rationality, the lack of civil debate. Wasn't it uh, the Washington Post I just cited who said, we need someone who can encourage civil debate. I believe Gillibrand presents herself as someone who would probably, uh, there's evidence to suggest that she understands that life is a learning process, not one in which someone walks around with this um, unimpeachable uh, intuitive insight into all things. So, I really like her sense of humility here. It is very impressive. I mean, frankly, she also just has very good energy. Uh, she's extraordinarily charismatic. She has a sense of, um, I think, emotional intelligence and awareness of how uh, when people question her, she seems very aware of their feelings and sensitivities. Um, so she has my attention. Also, she's not an extremist when it comes to how we're gonna deal with um, healthcare, which is one of my top uh, items on my policy wish list. Um, she's not quite a radical in favor of utterly overhauling the system at present and doing away with private healthcare, but she wants to create a public healthcare option that can compete with private healthcare to create more um, marketplace accountability. And I think this is probably a good idea, one of the better ideas out there. So I just think that she's presenting herself as remarkably rational uh, and intelligent and broad ranged in her thinking in contrast to a lot of the other candidates. So she really does have my attention there. Um, Amy Klobuchar, I mean, there really is a lot more I do need to learn about her. Um, I should say one of the things about her, this is, it might sound funny or strange to you. I don't know if you could relate to it, but actually one of the things that impresses me about her is that um, there's very little about her that really immediately turns me off. Um, I've listened to her speak and as I think um, certain um, people have put statements out describing her as remarkably poised, especially in the Kavanaugh hearings. I think I read that in a, I wanna say New York Times or Washington Post, uh, breakdown about the candidates. Um, she was remarkably poised in the Kavanaugh hearings, and she um, is someone who comes on uh, the public. Um, she comes, presents herself to the public, in my opinion, as someone who is out there to have very constructive, um, civil conversations and has my attention for that reason. Um, next, Beto O'Rourke. I think in the first place, Beto O'Rourke has uh, what I would characterize as exceptional, uh, an exceptional sense of energy and an exceptional gift in his devotion to connecting with the electorate, connecting with the American people communicating with the American people in such a way that he comes across as more transparent and passionate than um, narcissistic, um, self-interested, and um, just playing a game. Um, so he, he impresses me with respect to that. Also, I mean, if you do a little bit of research on his past, he's really someone who has actually like felt around in life grope around for like what it is he's supposed to do. You know, he, he really comes across as a thinker. He really comes across as someone who really wanted to measure um, 
options that are out there in life before he dove right into um, politics. And that to me shows that he is reflective and thoughtful and is something I absolutely want in a presidential candidate. Um, obviously, he's been very good with his use also of social media in really bringing um, his uh, campaigning and his um, efforts, again, to the American people and making himself really remarkably accessible and relatable and palatable and presentable. So he really does have a real, um, is a real hand of, um, you know, assets. Um, and frankly, let's face it, he did an outstanding job in his um, run for Senate in Texas. And though he didn't win, he came damn close. And to pull that off really does require uh, a degree of absolutely remarkable excellence. So as a leader and as a, a guy who can synthesize a group of people and move forward a certain kind of effort, um, I think he's very impressive and deserves to be looked at very closely uh, for that reason. Finally, uh, the final person on this list that I wanted to take a few uh, moments to comment on, um, Elizabeth Warren. If I'm going to be honest with you, uh, there are things about Elizabeth Warren that do trouble me. Uh, I think she's a bit of a uh, hasty speaker and um, she doesn't, in my opinion, her calculus as she contemplates what she's going to do and say at times are, um, I think, not uh, decisions that I would really uh, get in front of there. Um, what she did that disconcerted me most, there were two things she did that uh, I was specifically uncomfortable uh, about. Uh, first and foremost, she was going around trumpeting herself as a nasty woman. And I get that this has a certain um, uh, women standing up for themselves and this being a really important thing and women uh, absolutely not taking nonsense from the misogyny that's out there, but I just didn't like this notion of her calling herself a nasty woman. I'm not sure that a woman really, why would a woman want to be thought of as nasty? Um, whether you're talking about sort of mean or something else, I just, to me, it seemed like uh, a sort of dip into the negative as opposed to a jump into the more constructive. So that was something I just, I, it, it just almost seemed sort of immature and uh, I don't know where the move to do that came from, if that was impulsive or, or if someone urged her to do that. Uh, she felt that it was sort of like a trending thing to say and therefore she had to be a part of it. I just don't know. But in my opinion, that was a bad calculation. Also, um, I mean, she she wanted to get her ethnicity tested, her uh, DNA test, and she wanted to prove that she had a um, Native American bloodline. And I think a lot of the American people don't act don't actually have the facts with respect to why this is so disconcerting. Um, I was fortunate to have taken a class on Native American culture and history and really learn a lot about it. And um, one of the things that's paramount in understanding um, a lot of uh, thinking among Native American tribes is that they don't tend to view themselves ethnically. They don't tend to view themselves in the context of blood and bloodline, what they call blood quantum. Um, and it's extraordinarily insulting to most Native Americans to say you have enough blood, uh, you have enough blood, uh, you have enough Native American ethnicity in your blood and your DNA to qualify as a member of this tribe or that tribe. In fact, Native American tribes have had a tendency to think in terms of being social people 
and inclusive people and people of ethos, a people who, who value not the color of your skin or where your family was from, but if you shared their views. And so it is a fact that in, um, tribes have let in uh, whites and African Americans and people of different technical ethnicities into their tribes. Moreover, um, the notion of blood quantum was used against Native Americans, for example, to perpetuate racist uh, ideology and policy and biases and things of that nature. And just the fact that Senator Warren had such a deep lack of knowledge about a demographic that had been so, has been so catastrophically um, abused in this country's history. Her lack of knowledge and sensitivity to that makes me wonder what other fundamental issues, for whatever reason, she just happens, maybe inadvertently even, to be deeply ignorant on, but uh, try to address anyway. That is something that makes me a little uncomfortable if she's going to be the president. That being said, Elizabeth Warren was one of the first candidates to openly come out and say, despite the potential political risks of what it can mean to her candidacy, that she believes President Trump needs to be impeached. And it was important for her to say this because she made it clear that What's important is that the Congress, to the best of its ability, hold the president accountable for violation of U.S. laws, even if current Department of Justice guidelines suggest that a president can't be indicted or prosecuted, which, by the way, is a bunch of BS. Uh, it's true that the guidelines exist, but the guidelines actually have no statutory um, Binding. They're not, they don't exist in stat in US statutes. They're, they're not laws. Um, but that's another conversation as we delve into the Mueller report um, for another time. Point being that, in my opinion, um, when it comes to like what's absolutely priority, what absolutely must be done, um, regardless of the consequences that could occur politically. Elizabeth Warren seems to have an eye on that. And she has my respect, she has my deep and profound respect for that. So she's in the running as far as uh, candidates that I have my eyes on. Again, I'm not close to uh, candidates that I didn't yet list. And I'm also not close to eliminating people that I put on my sort of watch list and want your opinions as well. So I encourage you to leave a comment on my blog, on my Facebook, on my Twitter, on my LinkedIn, email me, get in touch however you want. Um, I do look forward eventually to bringing other people's um, live streams into this, um, these uh, video blogs so that there could be, I think, a little bit more dialogue. I really do like dialogue. Um, uh, just sort of in the um, early phases of um, figuring out exactly what my uh, vlogging uh, approaches are gonna be moving forward. I wanna thank you so much for taking the time to listen to or watch uh, what I had to offer today. And I want to say that I hope you're going to have a wonderful day, a wonderful week, a wonderful spring. And I look forward to chatting with you very soon. Please uh, have a great day. Again, thank you so much. Please feel free to learn more about uh, my blog, Public Comment, at publiccomment.blog. And check me out on Facebook, check me out on LinkedIn, check me out on Twitter, etc. And I uh, look forward to chatting with you soon. Have a great day. Bye.